Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. This is an hour devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, as my precious bride likes me to say, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. An hour for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and you can log on by going to eldentaylor.com forward slash chat, where my partner, Ravinder, and her team will greet you. Okay, now, Ravinder, our What's Up segment for this week is not exactly what I might have expected a couple of months ago. This past week, we met on several matters, including our direction and plans for the coming future. We have wanted a two-hour show for nearly two years. I must admit to personally agonizing over the decision to leave Hay House Radio. Why don't you go ahead and unpack that decision and flesh out some of the ramifications, Rev? You know, of course, um, I'm sad as well about leaving. But on the other hand, it is really just an indication that we are ready to make the next step in growth, you know, to take the show even further. Um, and if anything, I would invite everyone out there to join us on that journey, you know, so that we can learn more, learn more deeply, uh, you know, all the things that we're looking at, having an hour show you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a great show, but it can be really difficult to go into depth. And we have been asked so many times for the two-hour show because oftentimes you're just getting warmed up and it's time to go. So we do have other plans in the work. You know, we're kind of working on them right now. The best way for everyone to keep in touch with all of this is, of course, to subscribe to your e-newsletter. And they can do that simply uh, by going to eldentaylor.com and click subscribe. You know, of course, like any e-news, it's, um, you know, your privacy is fully protected and you can unsubscribe anytime you like. But that is where Eldon always um, advertises anything, you know, that we have going on. And that is where he will be announcing the new show that will be uh, two hours and uh as I said, we'll be taking our journey further so that we, we you know, it, it's just time to, to do more. And I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, I'm sad to leave Hay House, but I'm really excited about the journey that's coming. I'm really hoping everyone's going to come join us. All right. So our last show with Hay House will be on the 29th of August. And on that day, we will have a sort of trip down memory lane. We would love your blessings, and we welcome your letters. And again, please do subscribe to my newsletter and join me on Facebook so we can stay in touch. All right, one more point of business. The new film from Free Mind Films, State of Mind, The Psychology of Control, is now available at Amazon and for a limited time on YouTube for free viewing. I am in this film, and the content, in my view, is a must-to-know. I, I really can't put it any more succinctly than that. To view it on YouTube, search YouTube for State of Mind, The Psychology of Control, full-length movie. Or again, it's available on Amazon. Okay, now every week I read some of your letters as our way of honoring your input. Last week our show was all about integrity, character, your personal best. Jasper wrote, I really needed to hear your show today. I'm a repairman, and there are so many around me that think it's okay to take shortcuts instead of really making sure that they have fixed everything. Thanks for reminding me of the importance to do my best. Richard commented, Are there not those who have pursued character and then been kicked in the booty? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> Sometimes the price of integrity, of honesty, is high. But the price for dishonesty and a weak character, I'm afraid it's just much higher. Mod Girl asked, Eldon, can you comment on when you are in that limbo area of your life when you don't have defined goals yet or have multiple conflicting goals? How can your program help that? Well, Mod Girl, indecision is a sort of tacit decision. Indeed, often people put off making decisions as one of their defense mechanisms. This form of procrastination particularly occurs when the decision may be 
one that puts them at risk, risk of giving up something, risk of failure and even risk of success. It's not at all uncommon today for some to hold on to both the fear of failure and the fear of success simultaneously. As such, crystallizing one's thinking, making clear goals, taking the time to create that old Ben Franklin tally sheet where we list the advantages and disadvantages to the alternatives, halting the procrastination if it means setting a deadline for your decision and then acting accordingly is exactly what the Personal Best Prosperity Program is all about. Moving on, Jenny wrote, I loved your show on prosperity on Hay House Radio. Claudia wrote, hi, Eldon, thank you for your show. Every week it is awesome. Don wrote, I absolutely love your show. I listen to you when I'm at work, and the time just flies by. Loretto wrote, love your show. I've been listening to your show off and on, but now I'm a Hay House Wisdom community member, and I have all your podcast shows in my iPhone catching up on what I had missed. Well, good for you, sir. Eileen wrote, I am a frequent listener of a lot of the Hay House radio authors. I enjoy learning and creating a more beautiful life, and Eldon has contributed to my fascination with feeling good and living abundantly. Chris wrote, thank you for your wonderful mind and the courage to be who you are. Well, thank you, Chris. All right, that's all the time we'll take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your email to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. We can't get all of your letters on the show, but they do impact our programming, and we thank you sincerely for your continued support and feedback. Now to today's show, Meals That Heal. I happened to be speaking with a friend of mine last week, and he asked about this week's show. When I gave him the title of the show, he immediately equipped a smart aleck answer. So now you're the galloping radio host of gourmet cooking? (laughs) Well, not quite. Mark Twain once said, The only way to keep your health is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. (laughs) Now, is that really true? Is it possible to enjoy meals rich with flavor that are satisfying in every way, while truly beneficial to your health? Or is it more like what Socrates said? Worthless people live only to eat and drink. People of worth eat and drink only to live. In other words, are we just fixated on food, thinking that it should be good when it's really just a means to an end? I mean, after all, I don't ask my automobile how the fuel tastes. And when I feed my pets, I make sure the food is the best nutritionally and the safest that I can find. Again, I don't give them a taste test. I do watch that my pet food is free of things like road kills, euthanized animals, and so forth. And believe it or not, most of the major popular pet foods out there have some or all of this kind of nutrition, if you can call it that, in them. Now, that said, it's getting harder and harder to discern the quality of food that we humans consume. Today, we must be aware of genetically modified organisms, so-called GMOs, for a lot of research has them implicated in everything from disease to birth defects. Some countries have flat outlawed them. Additionally, we have to become somewhat of our own experts on marketing as well as diet. You must watch carefully for the sneaky labeling. Ravinder's favorite is the blueberry mix that contains no real blueberries. Tell us about that one, Rav. You know, I get really upset about food. I think today's food simply isn't food. But yeah, you can go to the grocery store, get blueberry muffins with blueberry bits in it, and there won't be a speck of blueberry there. It just drives me crazy. The word games that are played constantly with our foods, the all natural that isn't natural, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It's, it's just one big trick. And it, yeah, it leaves me speechless because I am very, very upset about it. But, but I'm trying you, not to use bad language here. But they do give you blueberry flavored blue spots, don't they? <laughs> yeah, it's coloring, it's chemicals, it's something totally different, but it is not blueberry. And especially today when everyone's aware that blueberries are amongst the superfoods. So you want to eat more of them. Not that blueberry muffins are the best, but you 
I mean, if you have a choice between a chocolate muffin or a blueberry muffin, lots of people will choose the blueberry because, oh, I'll get some little benefit out of it. Uh Uh-uh. (laughs) Okay. Now, while Ravinder and I do watch closely, we still get caught. So this past week on a hot day for lunch, (laughs) Rav ordered herself a Pepsi. Well, Pepsi is reported to use aborted human fetal cells to flavor their product. And so Ravinder, forgetting this for a moment while thinking only about extinguishing her thirst on a hot day, imbibed some human fetal Shut cells. Shut up. I wanted a Coke. <laughs> and there wasn't Coke products available. There was just Pepsi. And I just, you're right, I did that. And it makes me want to throw up. All right. Is that disgusting? Well, let's see if you've missed your intake with this short list of many companies and products that allegedly employ this flavoring additive. All Pepsi soft drinks, no fear beverages, ocean spray beverages, Seattle's best coffee, Tezo beverages, Amp Energy beverages, Aquafina water, Aquafina flavored beverages, Sobe beverages, Gatorade beverages, and that one caught me. Fiesta Miranda beverages, Tropicana juices and beverages, some other companies allegedly using aborted human fetal cell flavoring include Nestle's products, Magi brand instant soups, Kraft, Cadbury Adams products, even gum such as blackjack chewing gum, Bubbaloo bubble gum, Bubblicious bubble gum. <laughs> Chiclets, Clorets, Dentine, Freshen Up Gum, Sour Cherry Gum, Sour Apple Gum, Stride, Trident, and the list goes on and on. It's easy to see that embracing a healthy living style by choosing our foods wisely isn't all that easy. But this sort of problem extends to our medications as well. This past week, I posted a new discovery that should alarm us all. It seems that 98 million Americans were given polio vaccine contaminated with cancer-causing virus, according to the CDC. So we find that the idea of meals that heal, food that eliminates pain, nutrition that promotes good health, while perhaps the healthy foods are more available to us all today than ever before, it's also much more important that we are selective in our choices. I met today's guest after one of my presentations in Canada. She is a delightful person, and her book is chock-a-block full of valuable dietary information and includes over 120 great recipes. It's a book. Go get the book. It's that simple. You know, if you care, go get this book. So let me introduce her to you. Julie Daniluk is a registered holistic nutritionist, and she hosts Healthy Gourmet on the Oprah Winfrey Network. A reality cooking show that highlights the ongoing battle between taste and nutrition as unique groups such as bikers, dragon boat racers, ballroom dancers, and the like challenge their taste buds with nutritious foods. Julie is a health expert for the Maryland Dennis Show and has appeared on numerous TV and radio shows including the Dr. Oz Show, CTV's Breakfast TV, Wild on Health, and Lisa Live Radio. Television viewers will also recognize Julie from her busted segments on The Right Fit, where acting as a nutrition encyclopedia, she examines the foods people need to stay healthy. Julie's food activism has led her to speak to Parliament about the potential health risks of genetically modified food, and in order to bring food advocacy issues to a wider audience, Julie has been the event producer for Biodiversity with David Suzuki, and Food Shares Field to Table Festival. Julie's search for nutritional understanding has taken her around the world and provided her one of her greatest joys to date, cooking on Greenpeace's tall sailing ship, Rainbow Warrior, during its GE Freeze New Zealand tour. I want her to cook for us. I mean, you've looked at that cookbook. We need her here to cook for us. It's a really good one. I found lots of uh, fabulous recipes in there. Absolutely. So today, we'll ask Julie all about her work and book, Meals That Heal Inflammation. Let's get her in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Julie Daniluk. Oh, my goodness. This is definitely a thrill to be on your show. I am so honored as I am a massive fan, and I just uh, am just so excited to share how food can be remarkably healing, yet can be delicious, because if it's not delicious, people are not going to climb on board. 
People so you mean we can get something between Socrates <laughs> and Mark Twain? You got it. It's absolutely <laughs> got to be both. And in this day and age, we can have it all. That's what we really are striving for, right? That we have joy in the moment and long-term joy. The short-term joy of the flavor and the long-term joy of our body having great vitality. Isn't that the truth? To begin with, Julie, you know, we like to know three things here. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And how do we use it? So to that end, please tell us a little about yourself and how you see yourself fulfilling your own mission. Well, I became a nutritionist uh, really as a, as a direct result of how powerful food was in healing my body. Um, I was in Thailand and ended up coming in contact with a very serious uh, foodborne pathogen in a pad thai that I was consuming, and I ended up with such severe food poisoning that I was temporarily paralyzed, and the bacteria just ravaged my gut and caused a severe post-infectious colitis. Um, I was sick for many years, and there was times when I felt like I was a 60-year-old living in a 30-year-old body, and I, I knew that there was absolutely something, a crisis point that was so severe I just had to change. And my husband, I remember him holding my, my face in his hands and, and just saying, Julie, what are you going to do to turn this around? When I was at my absolute worst, he was there. And I, I really owe him such gratitude that he, he made me face this, this piece that I couldn't go on having really bad colitis because it, it, it obviously becomes much more serious things as we age. And I, I just hit that low point. I hit the bottom and I said, that's it. I'm going to completely change everything. And I started writing down every single food that was healing and every single food that was inflammatory. And I spent five years deeply scientifically researching my book, Meals That Heal Inflammation. So people can feel comfortable that this is not just folklore. This is based in hard science. Um, there's hundreds of studies backing up what I'm saying, how food is remarkably healing and, and how you can really work to, to turn around extremely serious conditions. And now I can honestly say that I'm completely in remission. I am symptom-free and, and just am so thrilled to have that juicy vitality back. You know, I love genuine people, people that walk their talk. You are one of those folks. Tell us this. What is a registered holistic nutritionist and what must you do to gain that title? So registered holistic nutritionist, we follow the guidelines of naturopathic doctors Dietitians are often um, following the, um, the medical guidelines, and we are very much into the holistic principles that, that uh, really will help people with preventative protocols, and we really believe in, in holistic whole, um, well, the whole food model. So we we're, we're really um, encourage people to stay away from artificial foods of all kinds. Okay, now, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I just, I just am I'm so excited that that my, my biggest focus since 2001 has been a, being a serious campaigner against genetically modified food. And that's a real example of how um, the, the whole holistic model can, can be a solution. Organic food and, and real whole foods can be a solution to what is really happening to our food culture right now, which is unfortunately a great deal of factory farm processed foods. Now, that's exactly where I was going to go, you know. <laughs> uh, before we get into your book, you know, this is provocative enlightenment. Let's mm -hmm. take on some of the issues out there that everybody yeah. has so much interest in, you know, and one of them is a GMO. Yeah. Uh, Canada, you live in Canada, and your laws there are different than what they are in the United States. Here we have 25 states that are considering labeling laws. Um, that seems rather pitiful to me when nearly all of Europe and much of Asia has already deemed this process as unsafe. Unpack the state of affairs as it is today and give us whatever advice that you would you would provide. Uh, you know, what can we do as just, you know, here we are, folks. We're not members of parliament. We're not members of Congress. What can we do to facilitate um, the right approach to GMOs? Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to this. Um, I really do feel that genetically modified food is unhealthy. It's interesting that the American Academy of Environmental Medicine urges doctors to prescribe non-GMO diets for their patients because they've cited animal studies showing organ damage, gastrointestinal and immune system disorders, accelerated aging, and infertility. And we now realize that even, even by studying 
beyond animal studies, there is now new, uh, just on the brink of discovery, the human trials, the human studies, showing how genetic modified food can leave a material behind inside us, and that can potentially cause long-term problems. Um, un- unfortunately, the, the genetically modified soybean can transfer the DNA to the bacteria living within us, and that is really a concern. Um, my biggest issues is with genetically modified corn and soy because we eat them, we eat the entire gene package. And, and let's, let's just back up for a sec. Genetic modification is very, very different than natural, traditional plant breeding because they actually insert extra DNA. And that extra DNA can be from bacteria, it can be from viruses, it can be from um, other plants. Now, we haven't eaten anything that comes from other animals, but I'm sure that they're, they're moving towards yeah. superior things as we saw the potential of a fish gene being spliced within a tomato so that the tomatoes are actually able to um, live well beyond the frost because it takes on the antifreeze genes of the fish. Right. And that sounds good because we're feeding, it sounds like we would feed more people, but our concern is that the food production actually drops, that the, this is not even good for the farmer. It's not even good for the environment because it actually increases, long term, it increases herbicide use. A lot of these GM crops are actually engineered to be herbicide tolerant, and unfortunately that will breed killer weeds, like serious weeds, so that you end up having to spray greater and greater amounts of pesticides. So the whole reason that GMOs were created, hey, if we, if we put the, the actual GMO um, bacillus thermogensis gene right into the plant, then we can reduce the use of herbicides. The complete opposite turned out to be true. So there's so many reasons why I'm passionate that GMOs need to stay off our plate. Yeah, totally um, counterproductive yeah. strategy, this GMO. And, and you increase the pesticides, you increase the herbicides, and we discover now the new research that was released this last week, that that's what's wiping out the bees. Yeah. Well, that knocks out the pollination. But, yeah. you know, we, we get caught. You know, we want to have a garden in our backyard. My wife and I, we have our own little garden. So you go out and buy your seed. Uh, you know, unless you're buying the seed maybe from a Quaker family or something, you're likely getting GMO seed. I, I mean, that too becomes an issue, doesn't it? Definitely. That's why I do encourage people when they're planting their gardens to look for organic seed. By definition, organic, certified organics in the United States, they're not allowed to have genetic modification within the seeds. So that's a very calming assurance is that if you choose organic seeds, then then we know that the genes are the heritage, uh, the actual heritage varieties and the healthy food that we've, we, our bodies have become accustomed over thousands of years. It's okay. really exciting what's going on with the labeling issue. Um, it's great that Connecticut is the first state to pass a labeling law. And New York City, how appropriate is this? Today, today is their public hearing on genetic modification right in New York City, and they are going to soon decide on whether New York State becomes uh, uh, absolutely must, if you must label GMOs within New York. If that happens, um, I just want to state the bill. It's um, Bill S3835. So everyone definitely check that out. If you really focus in on, on making sure that the labeling happens, it's going to create a wonderful stir across, uh, across all of the states. Now, California lost their labeling law. They, uh, unfortunately, it was voted down. So it's very important that New York, um, that this issue is handled and that we have some labeling because there is so much, at least when we have labeling, we can make the choice. And, and we know that, that North Americans desperately want this labeling in place. Well, and, and you know, the, the doggone of it is, and we have a hard break coming up here, so we'll pick this up after the break. But the doggone of it is, is, you know, it's, it's the, the small voter, each of us as individuals that have to become a big voice. We have to become involved because on the other side of the equation, you have big business and big dollars, Monsanto and others that are pushing GMOs. Listen. Uh, we're speaking with Julie Daniluk about her work and book, Meals That Heal Inflammation. I can't give you a stronger support than 
Go get this book. If you're not already in our chat room, now's a great time to join in the conversation. We have a short film for you today featuring our guest. You can join the fun by logging into eldentaylor.com forward slash chat. We'll be right back after a few words from some of our friends. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're speaking with Julie Daniluk about her book and her work, Meals That Heal. But before we get back to the show, I want to invite you to join me on Facebook as a friend or a fan. I post regularly everything from where I am and what's on next to the latest in science, technology, and consciousness studies. And from time to time, some of my own opinions about the world we live in. I also want to remind you to be sure and register to receive my free newsletter when you visit my site. And one more point of business. I will be facilitating a very much hands-on workshop titled Mind Mastery for Life Mastery at the November I Can Do It conference in Pasadena. Please plan to join me. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. All the details are available on my website, eldentaylor.com, as well as on the Hay House site. All right. Before the break, we were discussing GMOs. And, and Julie, I know that the laws in the United States are different than they are in Canada, but you made a comment about organic seeds being free of GMOs. And, uh, you know, I wasn't I didn't want to say anything about that without getting some hard data, but I've got in front of me uh, uh, a conference uh, minutes from Organ Ecology, and there they make it really clear that a lot of organic seeds, according to the Organic Seed Alliance, uh, are contaminated with GMO uh, material. that They've been tainted. Uh, is, that, is it different? You know, in Canada than it is here, or no, we are we are facing GMO contamination. My thing is that if you if you want to empower yourself, at least when you go to organic, you know that they didn't intentionally gene splice that. They didn't they didn't put it in in there on purpose. Now we may have some contamination with some risk crops. So I think one thing that's uh, really great um, to to keep in mind is what are the safe foods that we can uh, really consider because there isn't that many crops that have been genetically modified right now. A lot of people um, are concerned that the genie is out of the bottle, but I'm so happy that there are a number of ingredients that are completely safe. So um, the the big ones that I'd I'd love you to to really be mindful of are are, um, corn, canola, and soybeans. Those are are the the biggest uh, genetically modified things at this time. And we have a number of things that are coming up that we should be mindful of, like wheat is on the docket, rice is on the docket. You can see how these are all the major crops, right? Because yeah. if you genetically modify those, then, then obviously it, it reaches so many mass-produced products. But luckily at this time, those are not on the market. Um, so I think if we choose wisely, um, especially with our, um, with our gardens, we can uh, be safe, to, safe assured. I don't think many people grow soya beans or corn in their backyard. Um, and corn is probably the trickiest one because it is really contaminated. If people are concerned about this, I highly recommend checking out the non-GMOproject.org. So the non-GMO project, I actually helped to start that back in, in, in the early 2000s. We, we banned genetically modified food from our personal grocery store, the Big Carrot, back in Canada, and we found that we weren't able to stand behind that claim because there was so much contamination. So the non-GMO project is fantastic because it's a third-party verifier that goes in and checks the farmer's fields and sees whether their products have actually been contaminated. So the great thing is this is based uh, in the States but is now um, really going global. And the non-GMO project is, is so helpful because they've developed this seal that can be used on thousands and thousands of products. So when you see the non-GMO project seal, then you know that that product has been tested and verified as a non-GMO product, which is very exciting. You know, you're an example of somebody I would like to keep around for two hours. (laughs) That's a fact. But, you know, I had a look at your blog Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And and of course your Facebook page and some of your other internet posts and and uh, you know what I want you to do is tell everyone where they can find your blog and tell us you know uh, about this you know meat glue that you find in fake steak and the so-called seafood scam that you've been writing about some of these other issues that our, our you know our listening audience is going to want to tap into you and let you become their nutritionist. Oh, fantastic! Well, thank you. My my blog is is just my name Julie Daniluk and that's D A N I L U K dot com, um, and we do cover some very cool um, subjects because I really want to dig up um, what is what is happening to our food supply and how can we ensure that it's as as healthy and healing as possible by avoiding some of these these trick foods as as your wife so so wisely pointed out the fake blueberries for instance right. we know that there's there's crazy artificial food coloring that affect children, that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder may be perpetuated by a brain's um, reaction to these artificial um, chemicals because they're actually made from petroleum. Um, so that there's a really great example of, of, of a food that in its natural state is perfect. It's incredible. It's anti-inflammatory. And in its artificial state is, is causing potential brain inflammation. So I really do want people to uh, look at a number of these food issues. If we can uh, think of um, the other hot topic you brought up with the fetal cell um, issue. Did you know that, that that's actually, they want to test the, the food flavorings that are completely artificial on fetal cells because they want to check the taste receptors to know whether the food will be more addictive and whether it will be actually received as, um, a bliss point as, as the fat and the salt and the sugar, is it at its absolute peak so that the food is accepted and absolutely lusted after by the public? Yeah. So, so that's, the, that's, that's the interesting thing about that whole topic is, is more that they're, they're using fetal cells in the testing of these products and that the broad spectrum of the product, and, and as you said, how many companies are under the umbrella of, say, Pepsi-Cola, that, that really is uh, shocking to me. When it comes you know, to... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no. What, I, I'm just... There's so many places to, uh, to dive in. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really excited to, to, to share. So you lead the conversation. Well, and I, and I love you doing that. There is some controversy out there about the, the fetal cells, you know. Uh, some people say that, no, they're not using it for testing. Some people say they're using it only for testing. Some people say, well, they use it for testing, but they also include it in the, in the end product. And, you know, when I did my own research on that, the preponderance of evidence uh, would suggest, in my view, that it's included in the product. It isn't just used in testing. What's your take on that? Well, I, I, could, I could not imagine why they would have to add it into the actual end product. And I would be shocked and horrified if the U.S. government would allow fetal tissue into a Pepsi-Cola product. Um, I do know that the, the government has allowed the testing to continue, which really makes no sense at all because the testing is completely unnecessary. There's many different ways to test. Um, you could even have um, people opt in to do these tests. There's no need to do animal testing or to use fetal, uh, fetal cells for the test. We, we simply Aborted need... fetal cells at yes, that. Yes, the fetal, the fetal cells we basically are just trying to see what their taste receptors and how they would respond. And let's remember what they're trying to test. They're trying to test artificial substances. And we know that we have so much evidence that, that when we go to an artificial substance, when we replace what nature provides, is when we really do uh, derail on the, on the health front. And so I, Sometimes I just, we don't discover that for many, many years down the highway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. like the CDC announcement on the the cancer virus that was in the uh, polio vaccine. You know, th- these were vaccines that were given back in the 60s. Uh, and, and we discover that here we 50 years later. Absolutely. And that's why I say, can we just go back to the way we used to do it 100 years ago, a uh, few hundred years ago, if we can really return to nature and look at our, 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 our entire evolution as a species? Um, that's really how we're, we're meant to eat. And that's all I'm really advocating for. My book, Meals That Heal, 
is that we, we just steer clear of anything that's artificially produced and that we, we embrace you, the things you, that naturally pop flavor and make us you know, foods taste fantastic. Excuse me, but you're grossly oversimplifying your book. <laughs> your book is much more than that. Now, listen, you know, what is, what is this stuff about meat glue in your fake steak? Well, meat glue is, is really used to ensure that you can have scraps stick together as a steak. And right. unfortunately, that, um, that, that really is leaving people feeling um, ripped off. And there is concern that when you use, say, pink slime, that you actually have to process that with a very heavy wash of uh, the, the chemicals used in the processing can be very harmful. So I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, concerned about factory farming, certainly factory farming, of meat is 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 uh, of, of the gravest concern for me. So I do think if people want to consume animal products, that we do have to uh, look at small farms and and really consider the natural, uh, because I don't know how else we can really unravel the the issues. It is fascinating that that they show that standard eating standard meat can reduce your lifespan by 5 to 10 years. That's the, the latest studies. I, I just want to point out, I don't think that's necessarily uh, the fact that, that, you know, we've been eating meat for many years, but the way it's processed and the way it's actually prepared by it's high today. grilling, that yeah. is, I think, why. Um, well, and I think the other that. concern has to be, listen, I mean, most beef, for all intent and purposes, even though corn is poisonous to a cow, they're fattened in that last little bit, you know, on corn. Mm. And yeah. and uh, that marbleizes the fat, and you know that adds a lot of flavor, and, and a lot of a lot of ranchers know that in a feedlot, that's what happens, you know. It and and if corn is full of GMOs, well, then the animal ends up full of that as well. Mm-hmm, definitely, and and the biggest concern I have is by force feeding them, well, not force feeding them, they they do like corn, but by eating great amounts of grain, um, it really throws off their actual intestinal flora, and that mm-hmm. can end up having a higher incidence of E. coli breakouts within conventional farming, where right. if you're eating grass, their meat is going to be higher in omega-3s, and they're going to have a healthier GI tract, which, which, which is really why there's a lower incidence of, of E. coli issues around organic farms and small farms. Okay, now, you know, I want to get to your book, but you, 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 just, you just hit one that I've got to ask about, all right? Mm-hmm. Omega threes. Yeah. New new study. Can fish oil cause prostate cancer? I think it's a very poorly constructed study, and there's twenty thousand uh, studies on omega threes. So I feel really passionate that omega threes are extremely important for reducing inflammation in the body. Um, and I, I did I did have a chance to really look at this, and I I think that unfortunately the um, the way that, that the media jumps on these studies, they don't really look at, I would love them to word it as in, new study found this, let's keep in mind that there has been, you know, another 5,000 studies that showed a, a completely different outcome. So that's my only concern with the new studies that are negative to things like omega-3s, is that the media just go nuts and, and really um, advertise the, the new claim without a really um, doing a deep investigation into the great benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. So people get scared away from it. And yeah. Yet you, okay. But some foods are touted as great for you, and yet they have hidden dangers. Take green tea, for example. I understand it can be dangerous for some. Well, very good for others. Tell us about that problem. Yes, a green tea is extraordinary for us. It contains epigallocatechin gallate, which is fantastic for killing hunger. It's a very powerful anti-cancer food that really helps to, to reduce the blood flow to cancer cells and tumors in our body. So it's very beneficial. The, the downside is that, um, unfortunately, green tea can be very high in fluoride. And if you have a fluoride uh, excess already and you have low thyroid, then unfortunately fluoride can interrupt the, the flow of iodine absorption because fluoride and iodine compete in the body. So unfortunately, you can have the green tea you're drinking um, potentially influence 
um, your, your iodine absorption. So I just want everyone to understand that, that there is 7 billion foods, for, there's 7 billion diets for 7 billion people. There's not one way to eat. And that we do have to take every food and investigate it. I encourage people to become their own Sherlock Holmes and really dive into trying on the foods for themselves and seeing how they feel by keeping a food journal and really uh, just seeing day by day how they feel. If they go off the inflammatory foods for eight weeks and then introduce them one at a time, then they'll really get a sense of whether that food is is a food that they want to incorporate long term. So see, you just redeemed me. Your book is not quite as simple as you would... (laughs) And perhaps made us think it, it, it is it is very important that we understand that uh, these alternatives exist and that uh, there isn't one size that fits all. Mm-hmm. Uh, let, let's let's do this. Let's go right to the subject of inflammation. And that is a major, major problem in America and it is worldwide. What is the basic cause of inflammation and, and how does how does diet influence it? So inflammation is your body's emergency response system to tell you that there's something that's wrong, that something has gone astray. And there's the, the four underlying causes for the alarm bells to go off. I call them the four eyes of inflammation. They're injury, which we know when we twist an ankle, we become inflamed. It's infection. Infections can be in the gut, infections of the skin, you name it, any sort of infection. And then an irritation caused by toxicity in our environment or uh, an a actual allergy that our body is constantly being irritated by. And then the last one being an imbalance, whether it be an immune system imbalance or whether it be a hormonal imbalance. And know that that one's often tied into the, the toxicity that we're seeing in our world and all these, these great things that we've brought up today. So I really think that if we address the four eyes by really looking at the foods that will help to repair the injuries, balance the immune system, Make sure to fight off those infections and really work to, to balance our hormones. Then all of a sudden, we have the, a real chance to turn off chronic inflammation. Because inflammation is a good thing. It's, it's what's supposed to red, you know, send the red alert, send the troops. And, but we're supposed to switch off that painful inflammation within about three days. And unfortunately, it, it goes into chronic inflammation when we can't turn off that switch. And that's where the superfood anti-inflammatory nutrition comes in because we've got so many powerful foods that work to, to really quiet down the fire of inflammation. And Give us an example of some of those foods, please, yeah, Julie. absolutely. Avocados are extraordinary, and they boost levels of glutathione, which is a powerful antioxidant that ramps up your immune system. It's so great. Sustainable fish like herring and sardines extremely high in eicosapentaenoic acid, which is EPA, which is a very powerful omega-3 that helps to turn off the inflammatory prostaglandins in our body that are causing pain. So that, that really is, I think, one of the most powerful ones. Shiitake mushrooms are one of a real personal favorite. They're high in these polyphenols that are very good at, at helping the liver, really protecting the liver from damage. And they also um, are a really good source of, um, of, the, of, of vitamin D, and that is extraordinary for the immune system. And then we've also got, um, you know, berries being really high in, in beautiful antioxidants that help to, they work like rust proofing in your, if you think of rust proofing your car, think of the berries like rust proofing your body because they, the antioxidants actually buffer the, the, the oxygen that causes the, the actual reactions within your tissues and reduce the pain and inflammation and also reduce your cortisol, which is causing a lot of the derailment of your hormones. So I'm a huge fan of, of course, the blueberries, the blackberries, the raspberries, the cranberries, and some of the more exotic ones that are coming up, the IC, the, the beautiful uh, goji berries. These are absolutely spectacular. And, and I think um, I'd love to, to give a, a big shout-out to pumpkin and squash because they, they have tremendous amounts of pro-vitamin A that really help to repair the lining of your gut. If we can repair the lining, then all of a sudden we can really absorb more nutrients and get you back on track faster. Um, there's the whole, uh, whole family of the anti-inflammatory uh, cruciferous veggies, that would be broccoli and, and kale and cabbage. 
These are amongst the most nutritious foods on the entire planet. They're ranked a thousand out of a thousand on the anti-inflammatory scale called the the Andy scale because they um, provide us indole three carbonyl, which is powerfully anti-inflammatory, and hormone balancing to help us our body get rid of the toxic xenoestrogens that are lurking um, in our food supply. Um, a really great example of xenoestrogen would be our the pesticides in our food. So by embracing more of these, this beautiful broccoli, we can help to get rid of those toxins that we're, we're so desperately needing to offload. I could go on and on. I just you know, can see and, it. I and, love it. And a lot of the foods that you list, you know, I, I have to, some of them I, I think, I, I don't like the taste of that. I, that's just, you know, I, I don't eat that because, no, I, I don't like that. But then your cookbook, you take these foods, you put them into recipes, a couple of which we have tried, and... You know, it's good. The food's good. You know, there, there's you. magic, I guess, to how you combine some of these foods as well. Yes, yes it's so important to find a way. A really good example, my dad is, is, is not a huge fan of, like, super, um, you know, granola-type healthy eating, cooking, etc. But if I can prepare it in a way that he's completely enrolled, when I make a bok choy stir-fry and throw in some cashews and and have lots of beautiful bright red pepper in there. He's absolutely in love with it. So I really throw down the gauntlet to anyone who says that they don't like veggies. They just haven't tried veggies in a way that has them really thrilled and enrolled to eat them. Um, because when we hit 7 to 10 veggies a day, that's when the magic happens. That's when we see a real reduction in pain. Um, and I, I just want people to keep reaching for it. And if you're not a big fan of the veggies, of course, reaching for something like cherries that have anthrocyanins that are powerfully anti-inflammatory, we can reduce arthritis pain. So we, we can get around it. We can find whatever works for you. I want to meet people where they're at and take them one step further towards juicy vitality. You, you know, I want to make sure we get this in. I've got a, a list of more questions, and, but we're running short of time. Julie, if our listening audience wants to reach out to you, they want to contact you, or they want to know more about you, you know, what is your website and, and are they able to do that? Yes, absolutely. I, I would love people to know more about my anti-inflammatory quick start program, which is available on my website. I actually want to give everybody a chance to know the anti-inflammatory foods. So I've provided a free giveaway, a free anti-inflammatory passport that you can um, download for free if you sign up for our, our wonderful previews of the anti-inflammatory uh, quick start program. You're going to get a great six-page passport to the anti-inflammatory guide and a really great poster that shows you the anti-inflammatory pyramid, and that's free. And that's, again, at Julie Daniluk, D-A-N-I-L-U-K dot com. And also my Facebook page is Julie Daniluk Nutrition, and my Twitter handle is just my name, at Julie Daniluk. And we absolutely love to keep the conversation flowing, for sure. Yeah, juliedaniluk.com. Okay, now, I've got one more big one for you, all right? Okay. Uh, you are well known for your healing meals, but if you could narrow it down to simply five items, what would be the most important ingredients to have in a healthy kitchen? Quickly. I would really uh, want people to have the best oils because that's a huge piece. So instead of having just standard veg veggie oil that you fry in, um, by reaching for um, the beautiful, unrefined, extra virgin olive oil um, as, as one option and, and an oil that really withstands heat well, like a, a virgin co coconut oil, would be amazing. Um, that would provide so many uh, options, and that, that's something you can use a little bit more for, for stir-frying. Um, did you know there's medium-chain triglycerides within the coconut oil that actually help to feed the brain? And there's preliminary research that's showing it's, it's wonderful for people who are trying to offset the potential of, of memory issues and people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So I'm very excited about that. The um, next big thing I, I want everyone to have is, is natural flavor enhancers. So instead of reaching for, say, MSG, reaching for some beautiful spices, the, the ginger and the turmeric are such great examples, um, and having tons of, of the Italian spices as well. These are, are really clinically proven to provide anti I, I could keep action. you forever, definitely, for at least another hour, but we're just <laughs> out of time, Julie. Okay, thank you. It's juliedaniluk.com. Don't miss out. 
Well, we've come to the end of another hour of provocative enlightenment. I want to thank our behind-the-scenes team, Kyle and Joe, as well as the rest of the gang at Hay House Radio for making what we do on this show so pleasurable. And, of course, a big thank you to Julie, our special guest, and to all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. Until then, remember, wherever you are in the world, believing in yourself always matters.